Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined by Mr. Henrique de Almeida. Henrique, welcome, man. Hey, Bart. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm a fan. I listen to your podcast constantly, and you are a positive force in our industry, and congratulations to you. I hope that uh, you keep doing what you're doing because it's really awesome what you're doing, so congrats on that. Thank you. This is a super interesting episode. I'm going to kind of talk about the episode and then I have to do a quick Patreon shout out. Um, But before we do, I want to tell people what we're talking about today is, and this was your idea and I think it was great, is making a living as a professional drummer and teacher. Going to be tips and tricks on how to do it. Um, You know, maybe how things have changed over the years, Uh, you know, like what, what people can expect when they go out and do it, manage your expectations. Maybe people think they're going to become a millionaire overnight doing it. Maybe that's not the case right away, but maybe it is for some people. So we're going to talk about all of that very soon. But um, real quick, Henrique, before we start, I got to mention this. Um, there's a new upper tier Patreon member, uh, Rick's Drum Shop, who's been on uh, the Patreon for a while, just bumped it up and they get a shout out now. So I want to mention that uh, Rick's Drum Shop is going to be doing the first ever RVA drum show, January 20th, 2024, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. in Richmond, Virginia. There's going to be a ton of drum builders. There's going to be performances. Tickets are only $15. So check that out. RVA Drum Show, January 20th. For more info, just check out Rick's Drum Shop RVA um, on Instagram, and you can you can get everything you want there. So um, all that being said, Henrik, let's jump in here, man. I think... So you are a professional drummer. You're a college professor with Berkeley. Uh, you're an author, composer, band leader, clinician, which right off the bat, that tells us that to be a professional drummer, you have to do a lot of different things. You have to wear a lot of different hats. So um, we're going to talk more about your background, your amazing you know, uh, talents and skills as we go. But um, let's just jump in here, man. How do you recommend that people start this journey of being a professional drummer? I think, in my opinion, the first thing that has to happen is the training, right? You have to acquire a lot of experience, and it's a process, as we all know that. And, of course, you know, I was born in 1965, where things are a lot different than it is now. You know, imagine a situation without the internet, no iPhones, no iTunes, And at the time, people still made a great living just performing. So uh, historically, you know, when you are a drummer uh, on the 70s and 80s, you know, a lot of people, including myself, made a living just playing the drums with bands. You either play live, go on tour with bands, and I did that, or you recording, uh, or even... uh, Some guys did what I did. I worked for RCA Records. I was born in Brazil and I I was in Recife, which is Northeast. But as I go right before going to college, I was in Rio de Janeiro working for RCA Records. So at on the beginning was, uh, you know, recording, playing, but now it's different. Like you said, you Mm -hmm. know, I think if you want to be a professional uh, musician today, um, you need to be doing a lot of different things, not only be on your instrument, like if you're a bass player or, or whatever instrument you play, in my opinion, and it's what I observe and what I do myself is you have to do different things. Like I do publishing, I own a brick and mortar school, an online school. So I think my suggestion is more you div- diversify your skills and gain more skills, the better. Yeah. And, and yes, the drum set coach academy is your business, which is awesome. And you just kind of give off this like, uh, y- you make me want to learn drums with you, which I think is part of it. Because when people are wanting to work with a drummer, they want to like that person and spend time with them, which I think is true across the board of being in a band. People want to be around you. They want to spend time with you, you know, but just backing up real quick, because that's a great point to start with of how it used to be. You'd perform, you would record, you'd make money, you'd support your family as a musician. To kind of learn where we came from, what do you think ended that? Was it the the change of like Spotify and, you know, Napster back in the day that made it so that isn't really a viable way to make a living for most drummers anymore? I think the whole uh, sharing thing, uh, 
when iTunes came and you selling a song for 99 cents, you know, I remember in the last CD that I recorded years ago, you know, $10,000, $5,000 to do a record, to hire musicians to go to the studio. And then, you know, they want to sell the whole CD for 99 cents a song. Yeah. You know, uh, but, you know, on the old days, the model, when I, when I was playing with a big pop star in Brazil, the model was this. You, you do a national tour and an international tour with the new songs. Then you go to the studio and you did a record. You did a LP, right? And yeah. then you go on a tour to promote the record. So you sold ticket sales and you sold uh, records. And now it's a little different, right? Like I know a lot of people that go, the people that still go on tour, which is a lot less, they make more money selling merchandise, hats and shirts, and and then they kind of giving the music away, you know, ticket sales. And, and I came from a generation where when I was on tour, you know, I used to play on soccer stadiums and trucks, big trucks would take all the gear, would take the stage, sound, equipment, and the band was flying everywhere, you know, usually paid by the label. Yeah, And then you pull up on a city and they set up the stage and the lights and the PA and everything. And you put, so, so this doesn't exist anymore. Most bands, first of all, there's no trucks. Okay. Venues now have their own sound. You get what you get, you know, maybe you travel with your cymbals, but you play on uh, what it called backline drums. So it's a whole different industry. And then the new generation, it's, they're growing up with this mentality that everything is free right? Music is sure. free, we can share. But um, I would like to, if I may, talk about two things that um, is very important uh, that I mentioned to my students at Berkeley. By the way, I just resigned from Berkeley last August to go full-time on my two businesses, just for Congrats. the record. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm full-time with the Drum Set Coach Academy here and the drumsetcoach.com. I love Berkeley. It was an amazing job, but we really didn't enjoy the lifestyle of the East Coast. I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old, and my quality of life in Colorado is much better sure. lifestyle. Anyway, yeah. but here's something that I hope helps young musicians. If you are a teenager and you, you're thinking about making a living as a drummer, I want you to think about two things. And I share that with my students at Berkeley, and you know, I, I've been teaching thousands of lessons just on my new school right now last summer i counted because everything is on my phone my schedule is on my phone last summer we crossed the 4000 sessions so it's probably 6000 lessons wow. now just on yeah. my school doesn't count the you know 11 12 years of berkeley i mean so i kind of have You've taught a, a lot of people <laughs> yeah so i ask them to think about two things and i hope this can help other people out there there is Art, the art of drumming. Okay, what is the art of drumming? It's like playing the drums because you love the drums, play what you want to play, and start what you want to do. So the art of drumming, right? And we have people who took these instrument abilities to a very high level, very high level, artistically. We can name thousands of people like that, but let's name one. Let's say Terry Bozio, for instance. That's so unique what he does, right? So artistic. Yeah. And this is something that you can do for the rest of your life. But if you want to be on the on the workforce, if you want to make money playing drums, you want to be a professional drummer, you don't have to stop the artistic side, but if you want to be on the workforce, what do you, I mean by that? If you want to be a member of a society of drummers that actually are making a living playing the drums, right? Then yeah. it's different. It's a different path that you're going to have to have because you have to think about service. I tell that in every class that I teach to this day. Actually, I just asked this this week in a class that I was teaching. What's the difference between a professional drummer and an amateur drummer? And you get all kinds of answers, but... Very rarely somebody gives the answers that I'm looking for, which is the difference between an amateur drummer and a professional drummer is the professional drummer get paid, right? I mean, that's I think that's kind of the definition of being pro or professional, in my opinion, is you do it 
and you make money doing it because then you can support in some capacity yourself. I think pro means you're doing it and getting paid for it. Yeah. So if you want to do that, right, if you really want to do that, you're going to have to get some skills that are going to be priority. Let's say you're 18 year old and somebody's telling, man, you have to find your own sound. You have to find yourself, which is awesome. But if you can't read music, you don't know styles, your drum doesn't sound good, you're not on time, you're not, there is a set of things that you're going to have to have in order to participate on the workforce, which being hired to provide a service to somebody else. So it's not about you. So that's one tip, you know, yep. think about when you're in a situation, like if somebody asked me to uh, go record their music or play with their band, my job there is not to arrive there and show everybody my drum skills or how good I am as a drummer or whatever. My primary job is to get in the situation and that's what worked for me. You know, I don't know, everybody's different, but that, I, sure. I can only tell you what I did, right? is to quickly know what am I doing here, why I'm here, and what can I do to quickly help whoever is paying me, right? Playing, help them achieve their goal. So in order to do that, I have to have a lot of skills. So that's why I teach and practice hand technique, foot technique, coordination, snare reading, chart reading, Brazilian styles, Afro-Cuban styles, Big all kinds of jazz styles. That why you need to have all this stuff is in order to develop develop the flexibility to provide the service to a larger range of customers. Do you understand? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a little different than somebody who I give you an example. Do you know who Daru Jones is? Yes. I mean, that's artistic. Look at his yeah. drum set. Look With at the his funky drum set. setup and yeah, I saw him. He did a clinic here at Badge's drum shop two years ago. So I saw it in person and it's funky, man. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't do that because yeah. I, I have to have a drum set that if you call me to do a big band job, Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, uh, generic, have to sound a certain way for me yeah. to work. I couldn't go in there and say, here's my drums. My bass drum is a water bottle. My, <laughs> my ride is a paper box. It's cool, but I really didn't make money like that. So no, you're like a Swiss army knife of drumming where you just, boom, I need to do this today. Boom. I need to do that tomorrow. Which, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and the other thing is like th the setup that I have here is the same for 30 years because back on the day when the studio was a thing, <laughs> when I did sessions, I don't know what I'm going to play. Right. So yeah. I, I walk in there, might be Afro Cuban. So I got some cowbells. It might be a rock thing. I got a double pedal in there. It might be a jazz thing. So I had to tune my thumbs, all the single ply on the thumbs, double ply on the floor thumbs might be a Latin thing might be a, so it has to be a, a drum set and cymbals that was not extreme. You know, it, it's not a rock kit. It's not a jazz kit. It's not a Latin kit. But I can do I can do everything with these drums. Does it make sense? So having yes, the proper yes. gear. So this is something that's the core of the way of thinking. If you want to be on the workforce, which now is changing a lot, right now, yeah. I personally, my main income does not come from live performances, you know, or even studio performance. It's coming from my own company, you know? Yeah. Well, to, to that was all amazing. So, and I want to mention this too, you said this before and we can dive deeper into each one. And I have a few questions specifically that I want to ask you, but you said to me before we started that drum set Academy is, is a, is a source of income, brick and mortar online selling products as a source of income, gigging lower on the totem pole as a, uh, source of income conventions, and and sort of uh, you know, nam and and clinics and things like that, and then more outside of the box things are sources of income. So what I'm getting from this and from anything, like again, my background as an audio engineer, as I worked as a session drummer at the studio where I did the audio engineering because it was easy. Hey, can you come down the hall play on this session? Which means I just got paid less because I was already working there. But you just need to do the work. It's that's not, right. there's not an easy that's way right. to do it, really. I think that's maybe worth saying is like, and it's true with anything, really, is 
someone wants the gig just as much as you do, maybe more. And if they're willing to work harder than you, they'll probably they'll probably get it over you because, you know, but there's always that, that factor of, yes, that person works hard, but but person B doesn't know when to close their mouth. So I'm going to give it to person A. There's there's that like, okay, you're yeah. a great drummer, but this person is annoying. <laughs> so we're going to yeah. give it to you. This episode is brought to you by Yana Tech. Yana Tech is happy to offer all natural products to help keep you at the top of your creativity. Yana Tech's formulas were created for musicians by Nicholas Magrone, who has worked in the natural product industry for over 20 years and is also a working musician and teacher of all things drum related. He understands the wellness demands that being a musician requires. Empower yourself and your creativity with Yana Tech's flagship product, Magnamind. Magnamind is an all-natural, nootropic formulation designed to support cognition, memory, and mood. This helps keep you sharp on the road, in the studio, or in the rehearsal space. Keep those pesky germs at bay with their immune-supporting formula, Defense 4. With vitamin C, vitamin D3, zinc, and quercetin, this can support your wellness while traveling, working long days and nights in the studio, or just encountering the demands of daily life. They also offer wild mountain oregano oil in capsules to help protect you during the cold and flu season. Throw a bottle in your carry-on to help shield you when the weather gets too cold for comfort. Use code DRUMHISTORY15 for 15% off your order. Find Yana Tech online at yanatech.store. That's Y-A-N-A tech dot store. And also, readers of the popular magazine Downbeat can also find Yana Tech in the current issue and in the upcoming winter issue featured at the 2024 Winter NAM show. Thanks to Yana Tech for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, you know? plus, you know, everybody wants to play with Sting, but can you, right? So yeah. it, it's like, uh, you know, the most important jobs that I ever got in my life, you know, like teaching at Berkeley, playing with Gloria Stefan, playing with uh, Victor Wooten, playing with Dave Allison from Megadeth, playing, you know, getting the gig with the Air Force Academy band. None of those gigs, zero, came from a YouTube quick tip from a marketing drummer, you know. He's, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's the first quick tip. He's a cool feel, million views. None of my really significant achievements came from that. It came from... A lot of work, you know, yeah. and so you want to be the guy that uh, if you if if you want to make a living as a drummer, and I'm not saying that's the only way. There is guys. I mean, look at Elvin Jones. He sticked with the way he played at the beginning. That was not cool for anybody the way he played, you know, until he, you know, met John Coltrane. Right, Elvin Jones was. He, I mean, there is ways to do that. You have to be really, you know, <laughs> yeah, courageous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, most people, you know, if you want to do that, basically to make a living as a drummer, you're going to have to be able to provide a service quickly to your clients, your students, your, your whoever is hiring you to play, to play the drums or to teach the drums. You have to provide a good service, a good product, that they're going to be satisfied about that. And that requires your training, your experience and the diligence and the hard work and be yeah. organized. So if you want to open a drum school, like I did, right, you need to learn, okay, if I want to open a drum school, how do I do that? What do I need to do that? How do I develop courses? How do I get the training to do that? There is a whole set of skills that you're going to have to have in order to make money as a professional drummer teaching, right? Yes, yes. And then find a great teacher. You know, for many years I was with Alan Dawson. From 1988 to 95, I was with Alan Dawson and Gary Shafee. So I learned to teach by having lessons with great teachers. How do I develop courses? Well, I was a course designer for Berkeley College of Music. I taught a lot of courses. So you have to have a yeah. experience first in order to, to get the, you have to plant the seed first before yeah. you collect the fruits, you know. Well, that's like that age old, well, how do I, uh, you can't do this job unless you don't have, if you don't have experience. Well, how do you get experience? You need to have the job yeah. <laughs> and you kind of got to figure it out. We've all been there where it's like entry level yeah. position must have five years of experience. And it's like, but how do I get the job to begin with? But there's ways you just have to find your, you know, get your toe in the door, do some free stuff. And I'm speaking again, yes. broad of just work in general, but yeah. 
Can I ask you, all right, I've got a list of some questions here. Yeah. You can answer as, yeah. as long or as short as you want. Yeah. But I think these might be um, just like on someone's mind of, 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 you know, what we're talking about with how to make a career of this. Do you have to be able to read music to make a career as a drummer? Uh, this is a great question, and here's how, how I answer thousands of students, okay? I have a question for, my answer is with questions, okay? <laughs> Do you think there is more gigs nowadays or less gigs? I would probably say less gigs. Do you think your competition is higher or less? Higher. So do you think you, you need to have less skills or more skills to be more competitive? More skills. That's a good, good So thought. let me give you an example. Uh, I was touring with a band called the Falconeers Jazz Big Band. It was the Air Force Academy premier big band group. Hmm. We played Carnegie Hall, jazz festivals. I had to read, right, to play on that band. We did albums. There's a great record called Sharing the Free. It's one of the best big band records I ever did. That training, like when I was at Berkeley, uh, the great... Terry Lynn Carrington, she plays with Herbie Hancock. If yeah, you don't phenomenal. know who she is, she's one of my heroes. Yes. She used to go to my office all the time because my office was on the up and up. I had a, a, a copy machine, coffee machine, microwave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, so the, she the used place to, to hang. <laughs> yeah, she used to go there to make copies, you know, and all this, I always giggle because we are c professional peers, but She's not my peer. She's like one of my heroes, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, always, I was always giggling when she goes there. But she recommended me to do some stuff with Gloria Stefan, which is a mega pop star. Totally. And uh, no audition, nothing. She just recommended and I got it, right? So I show up on the rehearsal. Man, there is charts in there. I had to sight read all that stuff, you know? Uh, or, you know, because of that, I got recommended to do some stuff with uh, Victor Wooten. He sent the music, you know, I, I talked yeah. to him and I said, hey, do you have charge for this? He said, no, I don't have charge for this, you know. And then he goes like, hey, I said, who's playing drums on this? Oh, this one is Steve Smith. How about this? All those great drums. So I had to transcribe. Sure. I had to know how to write music, transcribe the charts and memorize it, you know. Um, yeah. Gigs that gave me a lot of money I had to read. I could never got a gig as a full professor at Berkeley College of Music. If I don't know, you know, I had to teach chart reading. Actually, one of the, uh, Terry Lynn Carrington came to me and said, hey, I can't teach this chart reading class anymore because I'm too busy. Do you want it? I, I took it. So yeah. chart reading, snare reading is important because, you know, you're talking about out of the, out of the box uh, income. If you live on a city that has a community band or a symphony orchestra or, you know, any type of, wind ensemble you can't play if you're a drummer let's say you're not a timpanist so you can't play great mallets study snare drumming because snare drumming because i was great playing snare i played bass drum cymbal snare little percussion so i played i have a degree in performance from southern miss so i play yeah. marimba but i'm not a great mallet player so i but i could play third part so i made money playing orchestra Without being an orchestral expert, but because I'm a drummer and I study those things, this goes in line with what we're talking about. You know, if you learn how to read snare, you could get a job as a sub on a on an orchestra, playing bass drum, cymbal, snare, tambourine, castanets, playing third part that you can practice. You know, yeah. so reading, yeah. in my opinion, is essential. You know, uh, if you look at my some of my heroes, I know I'm a jazz fusion drummer, so my heroes might be people that most rock guys don't know, but Vinny Colaiuto, Steve Smith, Dave Wacko, Peter yep. Erskine, Steve Gadd, those guys read anything, you know? Oh, yeah. So I would say, yes, learn how to read. And uh, great news for students out there. Reading requires no talent. <laughs> you don't need any talent to read. It's just work, okay? That's true. And I can teach you how to read. I have court. Read. For you not to get a gig because you couldn't read is, is, is a sin. Now, learn how to learn by ear as well. I teach my students how to learn songs by ear fast. That's an investment. You know, because my degree is in jazz composition, if if you are a songwriter and you say, Henrik, I want you to record this song. Here's how the song goes. And you start playing the song. I understand 
And I suggest if you want to make a career as a drummer, try to learn this. Understand what an intro is, verse, chorus, pre-chorus, because I can do a block sure. chart real fast. I can listen to a song. If it's simple, you know, if it's simple, I can yeah. listen to a song one time. And as I'm listening, I'm sketching out the form and I can play yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And things become kind of formulaic to a degree once you know the formula. And now I want to say the, you know, devil's advocate, the other side of it, you know, better than me with this stuff, but there are always exceptions to the rule where if someone's listening to this, so they don't get like deflated, like, oh man, I don't know how to read. I can never make it as a drummer. Buddy Rich couldn't famously read music. There's people in big, huge, famous, mega millionaire drummers who are famous for being in a band who don't read. So yes, are you better off if you can read? Probably. But I'm okay at reading, but I would never be able to sit down. I mean, you, I'm, I'm on a different, you're on a different planet from me, but um, I played hundreds of sessions working at a studio playing on commercials and jingles. And I had a relationship there, but I would say that it was because I, I would chart it out, like you said, with the block chart or four times chorus, three times, and then I would do a little key at the top with the beat I was playing, and I did fine. Now, would I have maybe gotten the gig if I didn't know them and I just came in and I, it, it's, it's different. Don't be disencouraged if you can't read, but I'm telling you, it's not that complicated. Find a good teacher because... It's my experience that most people that made a career, like Danny Chambers can't read, okay? Yeah. But I played with a lot of people that play with Body Rich. I played with Phil Wilson, Wayne Nas, Greg Hopkins, Lynn Vivian, all those guys are Body Rich alumni. Uh, now, um, I'm telling you this, most people that I know that can't read and play in bands, either they are part of a band or they're yeah. playing rock and roll. You know, if you, yeah. I can show you recordings like, uh, you know, I did a tour featuring the drum set and I was playing the music of Pat Metheny. One of the songs is The Gathering Sky. You won't be able to, I mean, you can unless you really fast memorizing things. For instance, Dennis Chambers, you know, I was, I was at Berkeley one time and um, I was talking to Victor Wooten. He goes, what are you doing right now? And, and I said, I'm going to go home. He said, hey, I'm rehearsing upstairs with Dennis. Do you want to check it out? I said, yeah, I want to check it out. Yeah. So I go up there, and it's just Dennis Chambers and him and a saxophone player. I forgot his name. He plays with uh, Mike Stearns a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the three of them there. And I'm there, and uh, uh, Steve Bailey's the chairman of the bass department. I'm just sitting there watching this, right? And they're rehearsing. And Dennis is trying to learn the songs. You know, I stay there for a while. There was no charge. So it takes a while because they have to record. So then I went home. And then a few months later, I saw some YouTube videos. So Dennis doesn't read, but I wouldn't take this as a model because Dennis Chambers is not a normal drummer. Okay. No. I call, you know, like you have the top drummers and you have what I call top of the top. He's the top. He's like one of the few top of why I say that is because, yeah, he can't read. So a lot of drummers could sight read all that immediately. But if you see Dennis Chambers playing that a week later, two weeks later, nobody's going to be playing like he's, playing. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> you know, it's going to, it's going to be ridiculous. So, so basically it depends what you want to do. If you want to be able to walk in a place and play if Chick Corea, I know he passed, you know, I can say that without without a heavy heart that it's going to be very few gigs that I think I wouldn't take because I can't do it. If you want to sure. do that, if you want to be able to play a larger range of gigs faster, I recommend you read because That's there is good. a lot of stuff that you're going to be excluded from that income, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Opens so. up doors. Um, all right. But let's talk about something now. Another kind of question to bring up would be networking. Yeah. How important it is. Um, for me, I have found that uh, in my experience being either a drummer, audio engineer, doing video stuff, really one of the most important things is, is being able to talk to people, being able to know when to not talk. Uh, pretty much every gig of any kind I've ever gotten has come from a previous gig and has come from a recommendation or the, the networking you go to these events and and it's you know it's it's to me it seems very very important 
what's your thoughts on on networking and working and talking with other musicians to get more gigs? Yeah, I kind of, uh, we're talking about how the industry changed, right? Especially with yeah. the pandemic and all that stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the past and the present. Because in the past, yes, I had to really go out to jump sessions, just show my face, talk to as many people as possible. Because in the past, my main goal is to get more live gigs and more studio gigs. As I got older and, you know, had Miles and Max start being a father with two kids, going on tour was not really something that I really start to prioritize because in order to make money on live performers, I'll have to go out for three months, four months, maybe yeah. sometimes when a tour ended and I thought I was going to go home, you don't go home. You go to Europe or you go to, I don't do that anymore. Right. Also the pay kind of went down significantly. So when I got my gig at Berkeley, it's such a great salary, you know, six figure salary. I got the luxury since 2011. I only play gigs that I want to play because I made such a great money just teaching. I didn't have to take gigs that I didn't like. So my networks shift from trying to get more live gigs to maybe get more involved into education. So it's a different yeah. networking, you know, and also right now in the present, I'm so busy, Bart, like I, I have to wake up at five or six in the morning to practice here for a couple of hours. Then I homeschool my kids and I get in the car and I go to my school around noon and I teach nonstop from the one. Well, I have little breaks, but it's yeah, yeah. from the one in the afternoon to 8 p.m. I'm working yeah, and I'm full. I mean, if you look at my phone, it's like Drrr. so. So I really don't have time or I need to be networked, but that takes a while to get to where I am. I'm not saying that you, that I don't need networking. No, but, of course. But, but you're a, there, you're, you've reached kind of what you're trying to achieve, where to check in a little bit. We're talking about how to start to make a living as a professional drummer. You are doing it. You've been there. So, so yeah, you've kind of, after a while, you don't need to be doing all the running around. Yeah, for you know? a young musician, I would say, if you still live with your parents, you know, or you are adult, young adult, and you're thinking about really going to do a career with music. On the beginning, if you don't have the experience, you have to play for almost just say yes to everything. I did that. I don't do that anymore. But you have to do that because, uh, you know, when I talked about workforce and artistry, right? Here's another nugget for everybody that I think is going to help people, okay? Uh, think about this. The first priority to make a living as a professional musician is, uh, is acquire knowledge, right? Acquire knowledge. And I'm going to say something here that might be controversial, okay? I, I grew up as a street musician in Brazil, okay? Meaning I didn't go to school first. I, I start playing like everybody, playing bands, by the time I went to the conservatory to get training, harmony, year training, all that, I was already playing bands, right? Then I tour all over the world in Brazil. Then I go to Berkeley. So my first semester at Berkeley, I was about 23 years old. I already played Carnegie Hall, international tours. Did re I'm a student. Yeah. But I had the street experience. So don't let my master's degree fool you. I have a degree in jazz composition, a master's degree. So I know academia. And I, I taught college at Southern Miss and taught at the Berkeley College of Music. And I designed, so I have the academic stuff, but I have the street stuff, meaning like you have to, I don't know today if I want my son to go to Berkeley and pay $500,000 and start his career uh, business plan with 500000 in debt, you know? Yeah. That's what is controversial. You can, yes. if you don't, if instead of, you know, taking a loan for 500000 to pay college, I would buy property. And by the time you're my age, you can probably buy the whole college. Okay. <laughs> so, but take lessons. So priority number one, get knowledge, right? You have to learn stuff, learn stuff. How you do that? Private lessons, 
learn how to record, learn video, learn about whatever you want to learn about. Learn, learn, find a mentor, find a teacher, find people that are doing what you want to do successfully, right? I don't take financial advice from a guy that's bankrupt or marriage advice from a divorced guy, investment from the homeless. Sure. You know, I look at somebody, it's like, oh, this guy's doing that successful. Let's study that. So, so acquire knowledge. Now, here's what I say that you need to say yes to everything because once you acquire knowledge, you have to test it. How you test your knowledge, right? You test your knowledge by doing mistakes. You go to a gig, you get fired. Why did you get fired? You go to a gig, what you're doing is not working. You have to try something else. That's the beautiful thing. So don't be afraid of that. That's the best because you get in your knowledge and you test in your knowledge. Fail, 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 success, 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 fail, fail. Yeah. So why this is important? Because the third level is wisdom. How do you, how can you become wise? Experience. How you become wise? Wisdom is a result of acquiring knowledge testing the knowledge. Now I go to a situation and I know because of statistics, 90% of the time, these work on these situations. I might use that because when I did that, worked 90% of the time. Like Steve Gadd, I was listening to a documentary and um, I think it was um, Eric Clapton was saying, well, Steve, he plays the right thing right away. <laughs> hmm. You know, Steve Gadd, place the right thing right away. So took him years to be able to do that. Sure. You know, like, like yeah. what are you doing? You did how many episodes are you doing now? This is 226 or something. Yeah, yeah. you know how this go by now. But yeah, you, you, yeah. you didn't start like that, right? No. So acquire knowledge, test the knowledge, become wise by learn by mistakes. So you can now figure out, mistakes are going to still happen, but oh, it's going to yeah. be less and less. So that's yes. another saying, if you're making your notes on this, workforce versus artistry, do both, but understand that, you know, let's say you say, man, I hate jazz. Fine. I don't even have, you know, because I had a student sometimes at Berkeley, they need to learn how to play jazz and brushes. Some sure. students say, I don't even own a brush. I hate jazz. I tell them, that's fine. Just understand the consequences of your actions. If you don't do that, you're going to have less gigs and that's totally fine. You know, you're right, man. Uh, so, yeah. so artistry and workforce, work on them together, and then also think about acquiring the knowledge, test the knowledge, and hopefully become wise. This is going to yeah. help you to make a living as a drummer. Absolutely. Uh, very well put. All right. Uh, next one that I'm thinking that I think might be applicable to a lot of people where you're almost, um, uh, to be a professional drummer, it seems like, and with your list, especially with you and, and the Drum Set Coach Academy, it very much is. Being a professional drummer and being a teacher seem to go hand in hand. Like through college, I worked as a, even late at the end of high school, I worked as a private teacher going to people's house. Then I worked as a teacher at Sam Ash. Then I worked at the drum center of Cincinnati. And I really enjoyed teaching, working with kids. It's great. I think it takes a certain personality type to deal with little kids a lot. You can tell in five seconds you have that. I mean, you're a patient, kind of nice, fun guy. Um, but what about if you don't like kids, if you don't want to be a teacher, how do you go about being a professional drummer if you don't want to do that? If you don't want to start and do courses and teach, you just want to play. How do you go about doing that in 2023, almost 2024 when we're recording this? Well, you know, they, I think the business model, I mm -hmm. think being a parent helped me work with little kids because I, like yeah. I, I told you, I work with people like, you know, Mark Walker, Dave Garibaldi, Bill Gibson. This is like yeah. top of the line drummers. But I do teach beginners, eight years sure. old and 10 years old. It takes patience. It Yeah, it's not for everybody. But uh, before I go into just playing the drums, somebody who doesn't want to teach, right? That's what you're mentioning. Right? That's the question. Um, you know, the business model when I was at Berkeley in the late 80s to mid 90s was this, Okay. You, if you are a rock pop guy, you go to Los Angeles and hopefully get a big break with your band or find a famous pop rock band that has a label to go on tour. That was the business model for the rock guys. They would go to Los Angeles, you know, and here's a couple of examples of my friends who went to school with me, like uh, John Blackwell, you know, 
he was into pop music at school. He goes to LA. He he hook up with Prince. Everybody knows that story, right? Yeah. Antonio Sanchez. He was into jazz. The business model for the jazz guys, including myself, was like you go to New York City and you try your best to get a gig with Miles Dave, Chick Corea, Mike Stern, uh, you know, somebody, a jazz famous musician. So because then you create a name and do other gigs. That, that yep. that's the old model. I never I think one of the things that helps, I, I, you know, I talked to my friend once in a while, Billy Cobham, about this. Like he, he always questioned things. That's why he played open-handed, right? Because when he went mm. to the lessons as a little kid, the teacher goes, he goes, why I have to play like this? You know, I, <laughs> I always questioned because <laughs> every time I went to New York, the people that follow that business plan, they live like not so good. They are broke. You know, the percentage of the guys that did what Antonio Sanchez did to play with, it's like we have one Antonio Sanchez and 200 guys that didn't yeah, do that. Too many drummers to, there's the, the ratio of amazing drummers to famous jazz musicians who need drummers is not equal. Yeah. So I said, okay, I, I, I want a master's degree um, scholarship. So instead of going to New York, I went to do my master's. So, so that's the old model. So the the new model, if you don't want to teach and you just want to play the drums, then on the old days, the phone rings, you do networking, like you said, meet as many people as possible. And the, you still can do that. It's not as much as it used to be. And you're going to have to be on somebody who's touring. So your drum set skill needs to be on the up and up, right? You need to yeah. really be able to play, now you're in the workforce thing that we talked about. So if you want to not teach, you better be able to read, play all the styles, or if you want to just, okay, I'm going to have a metal drummer, you know, you narrow, go for it. Do what your heart says. Your life is not our life, right? But yeah, the, the thing I'm going to say that changed, the phone is not ringing as much now. You, my suggest, you need to create your own band. Let's say you say, I don't want to teach. I just want to play, and I'm, I play heavy metal. So you're going to have to create your band. You know, you have to be your own boss. That's what I do now. You know, I have my yeah. own school. So in order to do that, I don't know, because, you know, when I was growing up, in order to do that, that route was this. Let's say I'm in Colorado Springs, but it's 30 years ago, 20 years ago, right? The way you do that, you start with local clubs, and you, st you start a mailing list and you start to really create a tribe, right? You need a mailing sure. list followers for the band until you start packing the clubs on your local area, right? That's That was the old model, the, right? Yeah. Then if you, if you really know in this little city here, you go to the clubs that are states that are touching that state, right? You start to be regional. So not only start packing those clubs, Colorado Springs, or maybe I go to Denver, I go to other cities, and that's the beginning of becoming national or international, yeah. right? Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. I think that's the way it was to, if you just want to play. The problem that I had with that is when I did that, I had to be out for three, four months at the time on a van playing clubs from you know, setting up at three o'clock in the afternoon, playing a gig from eight to one in the morning, you know, get paid $200, Yeah. you know, yeah. go to a motel six and then uh, <laughs> drive another four hours. Yes. I would go home with a pile of cash, you know, like, you know, 3000, whatever it was, 4,000. But man, that was tough. I don't know if I want to do that now at my age, unless it's like a high end uh, touring. That's a younger. Situation. That's kind of like, uh, like I mean, I'm 33. I'm not like super duper old, but like uh, that. The idea of doing that doesn't sound as appealing to me as as uh, as it did when I was younger. Because I'm like, you know, I've stayed in many motel sixes. That's where I stay when I go to these drum shows because I'm cheap, and it's like. Man, that is not a pleasant experience when you're like, what? What's on the sheets? <laughs> what's on the wall? It's like you you want to you know you get used to this, but that's again if if you work hard, if you put up with the like really you know tough experiences, that's kind of when it pays off. Is if you stick with it, then you you can reap the benefits of of 
living that tough life and then things grow and you you watch it grow one by one. I mean, I think that's probably still the case. Can I try to help the people that do want to teach? Can I talk to yes. you a little bit okay, about Okay, so so now on the the other end of that, let's talk about like you said, teaching, and I really also want to talk about cuz we live in a, a, an age now where courses, social media, YouTube. Let's talk about that as well. But yeah, what if you now want to want to teach. Okay, I'm going to share with you a model, a business model that worked for me in every city that I ever lived. Right? Worked in Boston, worked in uh when I went to Mississippi to get my masters, worked in Dayton, Ohio, worked in Colorado Springs, then I left Colorado Springs. So, I don't know if we're going to work for you guys listening, but check this out. Every city that I went on the beginning, I started teaching from my house, right? Teach one student, two, three, four, five, six. Once I got enough student, some cities, I don't know if they still exist, but some music store, they rent rooms mm -hmm. for people to teach. And then you rent, a, the, the advantage of that is like, when you teach in your house, you can't teach everybody. Like you might play on the club and some guy like, hey man, I want to study with you. I don't know this guy. I don't want him to be in my house, right? Yeah. So yeah. I stood is more professional. Uh, then if you have you know, five, 10, 20 students on a store, that's when I made my move. I always moved to my own stuff. So I, I rented a room, not in a music store. You can rent an office space or mm -hmm. one time I rent a room on a, a realtor building that they have the lease, but they have empty office, office space. And then you can deal with uh, electronic drums or pads if you want to teach during the day. Sure. And then that's how I opened my own school eventually. But that's how I started teaching at home or teaching at a music store and creating a tribe, doing, uh, you know, recitals with my students, creating a little tribe. And then if you have 20... 30 students, 40 students, 50 students. That's a little business that you can do and you can still play. You can still play and still work, teaching during the day, playing at night, you know, and you can develop little curriculum for your students. And now that's how we started. And then if at a higher level, it's a little different, you know, because right now uh, here's some ideas. If you want to do a school, you need to figure out, what do you need to open a school? You know, you know, first of all, you're going to need a drum set, two pads, chairs. And then as yep. if you want to take it really serious now, you know, your office needs a, a fax machine, internet, you know, and, and then a, they, a vacuum, make it clean yeah, for mom, yeah. mom, mom to sit there <laughs> yeah, while yeah. the son or daughter is playing the drum lesson. I mean, yeah. it has to be a safe, clean environment. A yeah. lobby, chairs. I have a little stage, so I have my own venue. So I, when I play with my band, I have my own little jazz club. I don't yeah. need to go ask anybody to do a clinic. Like this week, Isaac Jumba is a, is a, is getting a lot of notice. He's a Brazilian drummer who, uh, He's getting a lot of attention. He calls me to meet me and said, man, I would love to, the possibility of doing a clinic at your school. I said, done. You know, I own the place. I don't need to go to a meeting. You yeah. know, I make decisions yeah. like that. But if you're trying to open a music school, it's good to have chairs and a little stage because you can do recitals, you can do your clinics, you can play with your band. It's really sure. awesome. And then create a curriculum because here's something that I think is going to help people. When I start teaching drums, my relationship with students, and that goes into how to make a living as a drummer, right? Yeah. You you come to have a lesson, you pay me for your lesson, and goodbye. I don't think about you unless you call me back, right? Yeah. So don't do that. Have a policy letter. Let them pay by month because one of the problems that I didn't make money was like somebody wouldn't show up, right? So now you- 24-hour cancellation policy kind of thing, or, or you don't do that at all. So you, you're sitting there- and you didn't make me. And so my, I never do that. It's tuition. You pay every month or you pay the quarter or you pay the uh. course. And then you have a policy letter. You also, um, you know, I create a curriculum. So instead of just thinking about you today, if you are a beginner, this is what we're going to do. If you are level two, level three, and then up to all the way to the way I teach at Berkeley. Does it make sense? So, you, so yeah. from the first day you take your students, you should have goals. And so that helps your business, but helps your student and it helps you to become a better teacher. You know, I also want to mention too, that like, uh, in my experience, I taught a lot of younger kids, five, yeah. six, seven years old. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's not 
it, it, it's a little like you got you know this kid's not practicing he's not getting better just you can't for me it was all about you just have to be patient who cares if they don't practice you know you want them to get better but they're coming back they're paying they're having fun now that i have a kid who's four and he's been taking guitar lessons it's just something for them to do but like you don't need to get hung up the same way you would if you're like teaching a 20 year old or an 18 year old who's trying to get into music school it's like just let them have fun don't it's all about being patient and nice and things like that and you know if the parents have a problem with it they'll let you know if you know little jimmy's not practicing enough or whatever but so i think being patient with kids is is number one but i want to also mention that so i do a lot with social media and stuff through the podcast which this is not my social media and YouTube is not exactly me sitting there playing the drums, growing a brand like that. I'm doing it for the podcast. Right. But I will say that I think anyone who's trying to make their social media presence grow, this is not easy. It's like I work on it about four hours every day, seven days a week, three to four hours. Uh, I mean, I remember posting things on social media in the hospital when baby, when kids are being born. Wow. You got to work on it all the time. Like there's no, and I've heard people say like, oh, I just don't want to do it. The benefits you get from being active on social media, engaging, if something doesn't work, switch it up. Maybe if you post yeah. videos of you playing every day and they're not getting that great of engagement, do something different, try something different, but yeah. it's not easy. It takes focus. But I think for people listening of, you know, how to be a professional drummer and teacher, 2024, really build your brand because then people go to you and look and say, gosh, this guy's got a really big following. Like it legitimizes you. And I can say that I've currently got a job where I'm editing video for a company. They looked at what I did for drum history podcast. And I got that job in a completely different industry, nothing to do with drums because of what I've done for the social presence of this. So you never know how, what you do here is going to affect you there. And it just makes you seem bigger than you are is what I would add pertaining to social media, how to use it, YouTube. YouTube is a grind, I tell you. But once yeah. it starts to pay off, uh, literally pay and figuratively pay off just with your your you know, your personal brand growing, it's really worth it. But uh nothing's nothing's easy. It all takes time, as I'm sure you you are well aware. <laughs> yeah. Uh you hit it on the head. Uh I'm gonna backtrack just a little because we yeah. are trying to help people make money as a drummer. That yeah. issue like you, you, you did some, you mentioned something that I didn't know until when I opened my own school, because I moved to Colorado Springs right out from Berkeley. And I'm a teaching at Berkeley college of music is the best students in the world. And it was like a cultural difference here because I had to understand that not everybody that takes drum lessons wants to be at the highest level. Sure. It's just right? fun. So yeah. some kids, they take drum lessons as a uh, expansion of their general education. Like they go to swimming lessons, karate, and drum lessons. And you have to understand who those guys are. Yes. And I have kids that are in high school that really to become a professional drummer. Now, here's a tip, uh, a suggestion that might help teachers out there, drummers that are teaching out there. I have something that I learned when I was in the military at the Drum Set Coach Academy. We have uh, quarterly awards, four awards every quarter, and student of the year, which we just presented last night, by the way. So mm, cool. we team up with Zildjian Vic first, the Dario Evans, Sonar Drums, all my sponsors. We have a lot of sponsors. And student of the year yesterday, they got a set of symbols from Zildjian. Nice. And student of the quarter... They get like a Vic first bag, a headphones, stick bag. They get a bunch of stuff, a splash. That's and we, awesome. we have something like this. This is actually available on Amazon, which is the Drum Set Coach uh, Journal to help little Johnny practice. And yeah. they, they, I mean, I'm not going to go into this, but this is a yeah, tool yeah. to help the parents at home, right? So, and Smart. then you see here. Uh, you know, David Gary Bowd, Mark Wark, Omar Hakeem, Rob Wallace. This, this is like something that I've been using for years that yeah. it helps them track. So when they practice, the parents, uh, s like they do their initials. So every week they bring this. If it's full, they get some points. So Very nice. So yeah. student of the quarter points are like how many snare drums you're reading, how many tunes you know, how many lessons you took, how many recitals you did. 
So that encourages them to stay focused because, you know, there is the quarterly award. You want to be the student of the quarter. And the reason is really not to, it's, it's not about the prizes, but it's about encourage them when they work hard, there are yeah. some benefits to that. That's so like that might psychology, have- psychology 101. I mean, we're, we're all chasing the, uh, you know, the carrot that's dangling in front of us. You want to be working towards something. Otherwise you're just floating out there or kind of, you know, you're a 12 year old, like I'm practicing, but I'm getting better. But why am I doing this? It's like, yeah. well, oh, I want to win student of the quarter. And this helps you making a living as a professional drummer because you, your, your business is going to be, you have reta- uh, recruiting, retention, expansion. Okay. You got to recruit constantly because there is all a student leaving the school, right? Retention, this help with retention, right? And expansion. Expansion can be from outside and from the inside because you can expand from the inside. Let's say you take private lessons every week, but you can also take a course, a lab, right? Let's say you go to private lessons for a half hour every week or an hour, but you also on the chart reading lab or a double bass lab or, uh, you know, YouTube lab or stage lab where they just yeah. do videos and play. Um, now, you said something also that remember when we talked about how the interest change and you said, what do you recommend for people who just want, don't want to teach? They yep. just want to play drums. This is new to me and you are an expert on this. The social media, it seems to me that it's paramount and I, I feel bad that I don't have the time because I'm so busy. But yeah. you are correct on that because I was reading this book about uh, social media and this guy was talking about the commitment of doing videos every day, every day, I call feeding the beast, right? Yes, and, yes. and it's so hard for me to do that every day because I don't have time. I'm busy working, yeah. but I'm going to share something really weird here. I used to have lower numbers because I'm, I don't have the time, right? But I need to yeah, make yeah. time. 2024, I'm going to try to make time. But for the listeners out there, listeners out there, so my numbers on Facebook on videos was like 1,000, 400, 300. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started doing a video every day for two weeks. Then some videos are 40,000. That's a big jump from yeah, 400 views to 40,000 views. They, what did I change? I just start doing a video every day, which is difficult, yeah. man. It's hard. So anyway, so if you listen to yes. this, listen to Bart because he's an expert on that and um, you know, you know, well, I mean, I appreciate you saying that, but I truly will say to people that they'll, you know, cause again, I'm at, uh, close to Instagram will freeze you out. Sometimes I've been at 90,000 on there for months. They, sometimes it doesn't move, but there's no secret. It just takes a lot of work. It takes experimenting. And I will say too, that, that, uh, episode 200 was that Neil Peart series with Paul Wells, which was kind of a success um kind of benchmark for me of like whoa people really like these series let's do more gear series that was four and a half years into this that was 200 episodes in so you got to experiment and try different things and quality matters consistency matters um you can schedule posts just keep doing it and keep trying it and i realize what henrique is saying that it, it is hard it is time consuming um everyone's got i mean i've got a uh, one-year-old, a four-year-old, another baby on the way, but I managed to edit things four hours a day, albeit I'm tired all the time and I don't really do anything but this outside of my normal eight-hour... Some days you work 12 hours, which I don't think any of us are... Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with doing, but it's fun. No one's putting a gun to our head and making us do social media, but the benefits you get from it are pretty enormous. And and I would say it, it also, it's kind of like working out where... Once you do it once, oh, I want to do that again. Oh, okay, I want to do it again. Oh, I want to do it again. But you skip a week, you kind of stop doing it. You skip two weeks, you skip a month, you go, eh, you kind of forget the benefits. Um, so, so be consistent and just set yourself up for success by making it easy. I plan to do a different episode on, on social media with, with, you know, down the road and, and, and how it affects the industry. But um, Henry, because we close things out here, man, I first want, I just want to say this is incredible. And full of great information that I think is is exactly what I was hoping to get out of you on, on how to make a career with this. But um, let's talk about the Drum Set Coach Academy and where people can find you. Um, you've proven clearly that you you know your stuff and are very knowledgeable and um, both as a teacher, as a player, but also as 
a businessman, how to how to make a career of this. So I'm sure you you give all that knowledge to your students. So tell us about that and where people can take lessons with you. Yes. Uh, before that, would you be offended if I ask you a question that I think sure. is going to help me and other people? Of course. Uh, you know, um, we we're talking about. We did this in hope that to inspire other people, give them ideas how to make a living as a drummer, right? Yep. Uh, in order, to, the way I'm doing that, I had to do a couple of things that I want to ask you how you do it because we talked before. And you're so busy. We both have family, so I think we yeah, have yeah, yeah. we have similar lifestyles where we own our own business. How we we juggle this with family and all that, right? Yeah. So, in my opinion, I think. Our brains were not originally created to get that amount of information that we're getting more and more and more and more. So one yeah. thing that helped me, and I want to ask you a question in a minute, it's like right now I have two bands. I own my own band, so I'm doing less, right? I uh, I have my own business, but I have to say no to a lot of things now because I have to sure. be focused. I have to wake up at five or six in the morning. I was never, I never did drugs. I was never like a heavy drinker, but I don't drink anymore because I think mm -hmm. it's a waste of time. Trying to live a healthier uh, schedule. I'm trying to be super organized. So I think that one of the reasons that I can make a living as a drummer is, and there is hard times. It's not, you know, during the pandemic was great for us. So on your own business, like, man, this is great. I'm amazed. Oh, this sucks. Oh my gosh, yeah. what I'm doing. It's a whole, yeah. you know, so there was tough, Risk hard reward. times, hard yeah. times, good times. But you have to really care and prioritize things and you have to be diligent. So my question to you before I go into how they find me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you manage all that? How do you do all you do with your family? And did you have to do any sacrifices for people listening out there that want to do what we want to do? Because I sacrifice a lot by saying no to a lot of things, waking up early, being like scheduled. It's like, yeah, like I treat like a business. Like if I work for myself, would I fire myself? You know, so yeah. how do you do everything that you do and keep it? you know, together? Well, that's a good question. I honestly feel like because of having such small kids, I truly do now kind of feel like I'm not driving the ship as much as I am, like literally like hanging on for dear life <laughs> because of what's happening right now. Like I'm sort of like always like, oh, I forgot to do that. The sacrifices would be like, I'm terrible at planning like a date to go on with my wife because I'm booking episodes to record here or, or booking because for my job, I shoot video and I edit video for clients and I work three days a week for a company doing their video and their social media. The question or the answer to that would be, I don't do pretty much anything else. I would, no matter what, from about 8 p.m. to midnight, I edit and work on drum history, be it answering emails, doing whatever. And then on weekends, I do it. I would just say it's, it's you are setting yourself up to... Uh, I set myself up to be, this is what I'm going to do all the time. Now, if that's four hours a day uh, times seven days, that's seven, 14, 20, like 28 to 35 hours a week working on it. Full time. But it does make money. If five years into this, if I did not make money doing this, like YouTube can actually pay a decent amount of money. I have advertising. I do this. I don't know if I would be doing it for fun anymore right, because right. I now truly like pay my a portion. I pay my kids school bill with the money from YouTube. So it's like you do need to see. It's real. It's real. It's real. You do need to see the benefit of what you're doing. Yeah. But for three years, it wasn't there. But you that was like when, yeah, but that was before I had, you know, small kids. But now I'm literally like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Conditioned to just work on this all the time. I haven't played in a band in about five years. I play the drums every day with my kids and I play and they dance around, but but I'm not playing in a band right now. So if I were to choose to play gigs with a band, that would take precedence over the podcast. Yeah. But um, I've chosen that this is what I'm going to do. But like I said, because I've put so much effort and time into this, 
it has legitimized everything else I do in my work for video and audio. Absolutely. And opened up the doors to be now I can yeah. do social media for people, for companies, because I've grown to a 90,000 Instagram and 20,000 Facebook because I've done it. So the reward has been not only just for drumming, but yeah. it's, it's, um, uh, it's paid off in other ways. But to really answer your question of how do I do it, I mean... I feel like I am very, I've gotten, I've had to choose. Like, I may not be able to answer people's emails because I'm now yeah. sitting here editing for four yeah. hours at night. Yeah. Because to answering an email might take 35 minutes yeah. because they gave you a really long, cool explanation of why they love this and had this piece of gear. Yeah, people don't see all this stuff that goes in the background. Like, my secret weapon is Erica, my wife, right? Because yes, yes. We, I don't know if you do that. We have the whole year calendar. The whole year uh, plan out. We are about to plan the whole year. That's going to help. And and I am old old school upstairs in the office. We have a paper calendar as well, right? And yeah. just one more thing. Sorry, so much stuff that I, no, yeah, I don't want to forget. It. For yeah. drummers out there that are like, man, there is no gigs on my town. There is, you know, I, I want to mention that because you said five years that you don't play on the band. Since yeah, yeah. I moved here, you know, if you live on a town that the clubs are not paying you, there is no venues. Do your own band. Rent a room. Create. I created. If I play, I don't understand this. Thirty years ago, a jazz gig was a hundred dollars. Thirty years later, a jazz gig is a hundred dollars. Yeah. What? Inflation has not. It gone should be. With it. it never yeah. change. It's less. So, I do my gigs on my own venue. I sell my own tickets. It's not. A, it's not a money maker, but I make more money playing. If you rent a, a church room, I find a room that you can rent. Put the show together with your band or your drum clinic by yourself. Do a clinic, rent a create. Basically, create your own situation. You're gonna be happier than having a club paying you ten bucks. You yeah. know, I'm just want to say that since you mentioned that, you know. Well, you're you're well. First, no, two things. Number one. You're a businessman. I think that having a business mind with this whole topic will help everything that people yes. are, are doing. Yep. Treat yourself like a business. And number two, everything I just said where I'm like working my butt off to do this, I'm doing it on purpose. I'm doing it because I get to hang out with people like That's you. That's right. That's no, right. No one's making me do this. The That's benefit right. of going to a drum show and hearing people say I love the show is is so worth it. Uh, so I'm not complaining in any way. I love to work hard. My, my go-to is open up my computer, put a movie on in the background, edit drum history. And I love it. It's, it's amazing. So, um, thank you for asking that. I appreciate being, you know, uh, there's no secret though, really. It's just, it takes a ton of work, but, yeah. um, all right, Henrik, let's close this out to keep it, keep it kind of at a shorter, shorter episode to, because the Tony yeah. Williams yeah. ones yeah. were two yeah. and a half hours long. Where do they find you? Okay. The drum set is my online school. You can just Google, uh, you know, Google it, thedrumsetcoach.com. And what I do there, you can buy books. I'm also on Hudson Music, Amazon, and the Drum Set Coach Academy. All the information about the Drum Set Coach Academy it is at thedrumsetcoach.com. What is the drumsetcoach.com? Uh, when I was teaching at Berkeley, I was a, a course designer. I, the first course I designed for them, they got 93% of royalties, and I got 7% of royalties. I said, no, thanks. So... You can take real college courses that I taught at the college, designed for the college. This is not, you know, fake stuff that I came up on my yeah. basement. You can take those at the drumsetcoach.com two ways. You can take a full semester, like we just graduated several classes, which is on Zoom. Just like I teach at Berkeley online, every week there is a class. You with six people, eight people in class. You have midterm, final exam. You got a certificate. It's not college credits because it's cheaper, but it's, it's the same thing that I taught at Berkeley that I designed. Or you can take self-paced course. You can buy the course and take it by yourself, which is even cheaper. Yeah. Right. So now, since I'm a teacher, what we talked about here, I want you to review the things that Bart and I talk about if you listen to this. Number one, learn. Right. If you want to make a living as a profession, you got to learn. Train yourself, read books, take private lessons, talk to Bart, talk to me, find a mentor, talk, to, learn, 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 learn. Number two, test. You got to test your knowledge. Don't, don't be afraid of failure. Go, go rent a room, do a clinic. If two people show up, that's fine. 
Do it again. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Now, if you do enough and that's not working, kill it. Try something else, right? If you have a band, you don't have any gigs, find your own venue, rent a room, take the initiative of being a leader, test your knowledge, become wise, learn by your mistakes, right? Become wise. Yep. Think about, are you going to be part of the workforce or just be an artist or do both? I recommend you do both. You nowadays, you need to be the leader. Don't think about working for somebody else, waiting for that big break for somebody to hire you. Yes, that's great if it happens. Don't wait for that. Create your situation. Create your band. Create your clinic. Create. Be autosufficient and have integrity, right? Like, I, I'm not going to go on YouTube with a clown nose dress as Spider-Man to teach drums. <laughs> it's not me. If that's you, go for it. I am yeah. old school. But those things should help you. If you need help with ideas, contact me. I, I'll be glad to help you. I know that this was like an hour. We probably need 10 hours to talk yeah. about everything we forgot. But Bart, yeah. uh, before I go, I want to tell you thank you. Because the world right now, we have wars, inflation, divisiveness. I mean, you have so many negative things in the world. And I want to tell you, I hope I represent a lot of people out there. You're such a positive force in my life. I go for a walk every day. I listen to your show. I learn a lot. You, you are asking the right questions. You have the right people. I can tell on your heart that you have your integrity on what you're doing. And I'm so honored to be part of your podcast. Keep doing what we're doing. I listen to almost every day. So that's awesome. So you're doing a great job. I hope I that, appreciate that God man. bless your family and what are you doing? I hope you keep doing that because you're helping a lot of people and you're helping me for certain. And if you listen to Bart, you know, one thing that I learned, if you listen to one episode, yes, you learn. But once you start listening to a lot of them start things start to connect that you hear from different people and I'm learning stuff that I'm applying to my business. So part of making yeah. a living as a professional drummer, believe it or not, listen to the drum history podcast is self-improvement for me. You know? Yeah. So, well you the last thing I'll say is you mentioned before that you listened to some of the, well, thank you very much for saying all that. But you you mentioned that you listened to the you know business, the the company episodes and you've taken some of those um things that big brands have done and applied it to your business, which is very cool and very smart way to do it. So yeah. um, I appreciate the kind words and thank you to you and thank you to your wife, Erica, for um, kind of yeah. help with coordinating and and uh, it's it's cool. You've made it a family thing. And uh, again, happy holidays to your family. Yeah. And um, thank you to everyone for listening in general. I hope everyone has a great end of 2023. Yes. And thanks to all the support and uh, just keep keep going. Keep playing, keep practicing. That's how you, you know, if you if you're playing the drums, you're on the right path. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Henrik, I appreciate you being here, man. Thanks Thank for your you. time. Hope that you and your family can visit, and I mean it. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Colorado, Colorado, Colorado it's Springs. Beautiful. Someday we'll be there. Yes, yeah, nice. <laughs> All right, thanks, hey, Henrik. God bless you, and uh, God bless everybody. See you soon. Keep going. Surround yourself with positive people.